customs and rituals. As man's mind and soul evolved, as he fought his psychological battles of attainment, renewal, realization, and conscious awareness, and gave them concrete form and symbol in his learning, art, and literature, so was formed the whole mystical and mythological store of our entire psychic past. Individually, in our own time and lives, we go through the same psychic battles as recorded in mythology. This is, of course, particularly true of concert pianists who go through tremendous Herculean battles every time they step onto a concert stage. It's also true of composers who have to write commissions, to write symphonies that have to be met uh, by deadlines and presented to orchestras and conductors in time. Um, so we have um, our battles in modern days, uh, mythological battles in modern times, but without the aid of the wise old man to guide us, save when we find one in our guise of the analyst or the, the psychiatrist in time of need. This is our again. We undertake heroic journeys just as did the great heroes of mythology, Hercules, Perseus and Theseus did, and sometimes we are even helped in our tasks by similar miraculous advice, forewarnings and assistance. And like Prometheus, we challenge the gods, courting disaster, which we sometimes reap and sometimes triumph over. Over and over again, we repeat what man in his short and dangerous passage from birth to death has undergone consciously and unconsciously from the beginning of his history. Um, I find that extremely um, inspiring and challenging to deal with. Um, and um, very relevant to all of us as pianists, not just to concert pianists stepping on the stage, but to everyone who um, undertakes um, the learning of our instrument and who teaches our instrument and who has the piano in their lives. Um, I, think, I think it can help enormously in our progress as well. Uh, I think one of the first things to say about the, this sort of interpretation of a kind of uh, collective experience of piano playing and uh, piano um, literature that accumulates and gathers somewhere out there that we've got to tune into and connect to um, is actually coming from Ferruccio Busoni who talked about pianistic Darwinism and I found this a fascinating subject. It's a little bit like breaking the three minute mile which Roger Bannister did in the 1950s. Now every Olympic 1500 meter runner could easily break the three minute mile but it was an, a, an, a sort of a barrier that people couldn't get beyond at a certain point. Similarly, um, in the repertoire, um, it used to be considered extraordinary for teenagers to play the Liszt B minor sonata, and now it's kind of expected. My own, one of my own main teachers, Peter Caton, was only the second or third British pianist to play Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto in the early 1950s. And it was considered an extraordinary thing even to attempt to play it, and now it's expected. So that's a, a kind of pianistic Darwinism. And as people conquer certain things, they become easier and more and more people are able to do it. And it's an interesting phenomenon, not necessarily a, an inspiring one, but just a fact. Ligeti studies is another example. When Ligeti produced them and brought them to the Royal Academy in the 1980s, everybody said they were unplayable. And now um, every other young pianist seems able to play Les Scalier du Diable from memory without too much difficulty. Um, so that's one aspect of it, and I find it fascinating that somehow we are able to tackle things after other people have done them, um, and it, it's mysterious. But what's also interesting about um, the collective unconsciousness is the letting go of the ego. Um, whereas with Freud, we're tending to look inwards. I, I, I think it's much more inspiring to let go of our inner anxieties and psyches by looking out to the music as an energized force out there which we can tap into and let go of ourselves. Um, I think it's very important to develop a, a quasi-Buddhist approach as a performer, as a teacher, as a student, whereby we try to do our very hardest and utmost not to be motivated by competitive needs, by notices in the press, by materialistic success, but get our satisfaction and our rewards 
from the music itself. That's an extremely challenging thing for some people who are brought up from day one in this world with values that are market driven. And um, some would say it's actually repressing human nature. But I would say, um, when are you at your happiest as a human being? Are you at your happiest when you're alone? When you, or are you at your happiest when you're sharing things with other people, when you're loving people, when you're creating, when you're part of something bigger than yourself? We all talk about being in the zone as a, a, an ideal when we are working at our utmost, at our greatest potential, the optimum uh, performance potential as, per, as musicians. Athletes talk about being in the zone as well. And it's when something very mysterious happens. It's when we lose track of time, when time seems to stand still, when we're not aware of very much except the pleasure of the now, the moment, when everything seems to play itself, when we aren't aware of what we're doing, it just happens. And if we're going to get into this ideal, we have to get rid of our ego. I think there's no question about that. Um, and I think everything we can do in our lives to get more and more of this zone experience um, should be developed. We should try as hard as possible. But we'll explore some of the ways in which you can do that. Um, because I think there's no doubt that is the, the high point of human existence and endeavour. Certainly, as a musician, that's what we should be aiming for. Um, quite often, with Alfred Brendel, apparently, he reached his zone point, peak, in, in the piece immediately after the interval. Perhaps after he'd felt that he'd proven himself in the first half. And Horowitz talked a lot of, in his writings and interviews about the fact that it was vital to win the audience over uh, by the interval and if you hadn't done that it wouldn't be a successful concert. Um, but how sad to feel that artists of the calibre of Horowitz felt that they had to battle to win in inverted commas, whereas wouldn't it be wonderful to feel that the great zone pianist, if one exists, would be in the zone the moment they stepped on the stage and walk forward and play and feel that there were no battles necessary to win. On the subject of getting in the zone, I'd like to also mention Solomon, the great British pianist, um, and my teacher Peter Caton talked um, nearly three decades later about an extraordinary performance Solomon gave in the Royal Festival Hall of the Opus 111 Sonata of Beethoven and it came just before the interval and he said it was really amazing because afterwards uh, inevitably there was a long delay before the clap started which is always a very good sign. But he said in the foyer of the Royal Festival Hall, a full Festival Hall, this is the early days of it, just after the Festival of Britain, everybody seemed to be in a kind of hypnotised daze. And people were going around, um, you know, getting drinks, but not saying anything. There was a complete hush and silence. And of course, that second movement, the Arietta, is perhaps the ultimate zone piece, isn't it? In a sense that time really does stand still. And, and um, Beethoven focuses on the very essence of a theme. Whereas in the sonata that I played the other night, Opus 109, we get various aspects of a theme. Um, moving towards spirituality and Parnassus and heaven at the end, whereas going a stage farther, I would say, in 111, it's as though Beethoven is fine-tuning or focusing his, his vision um, into the very essence of what the theme or what music is about. Um, so that, that's a wonderful, um, very, very vivid memory from a concert goer and a professional pianist many years later that stays with me. Another image I'd like to share with you, or memory, is of uh, Yonti Solomon remembering Myra Hess. And he studied with Myra Hess, of course, and uh, Myra said to him, um, the most extraordinary memory I have of Ferruccio Busoni is of him playing the Hammerclavier Sonata in London in 1920. Some something, 1921 or two, and she said, the only thing I can remember about it is the first octave of the slow movement, um, which as you know is um, and nearly four and a half decades later, um, 
Dame Myra could only remember the A, but she said the extraordinary um, uh, goose pimples and nerve tingling ends that I got from that one octave have remained with me for 40 or more years. Um, and that's what it's all about, I would suggest. So it's tuning in to something mysterious and magical. I've been reading a lot over the holidays about um, the left brain and the right brain, which we all know about and talk about. Uh, but I think it, it, we can't get enough of that reminders. Uh, the left being, brain being very um, analytical and the right brain being very intuitive. We get an awful lot of... Um, education traditionally and currently about the vitality of training with discipline the left brain and how we've got to be ordered and have timetables and schedules and teachers have got to have lesson plans and write up reports and know exactly what they're going to do at every moment of the day there's even something horrendous which i tried for a bit um, called micromanagement. Have any of you heard of that? Where you account for every five minutes of the day ruthlessly. Um, there are some people that just cannot cope with that, who are so right brain oriented that they can't cope with that kind of discipline. I mean, our very furniture that we have in our bedrooms are often totally unsuitable for certain individuals. Certain people, like myself, like to have things in piles around the room and we need special furniture designed to cope with our piles. It's not that we're untidy, it's that we're more right brain oriented. <laughs> I think that's very important. So, so I wouldn't get upset with people that are apparently untidy by left wing, left brain bias. Um, that, that, that there, is, there is method in the madness. The right brain is where we get all our creativity and imagination and intuition. And so often, if you speak to piano teachers who have had success, the, the, the eureka moments that come out of the blue and that seem to have nothing to do with lesson plans whatsoever. And progress is often made totally out of the blue without any preparation whatsoever. And really teachers that ignore that um, and when they hear a pupil coming in with enthusiasm about something are, are going to destroy the pupil's um, progress in many respects. One famous story I heard about a, a very distinguished piano teacher um, who asked her pupil to learn X, Y and Z and the pupil came running into the, the lesson after the holidays and said, I've actually learned Mendelssohn's G minor concerto and the teacher screamed at the pupil took up the Mendelssohn, tore it up page by page and threw it in the bin and said, why have you not done what I said? The, le the relationship didn't last very long. Um, you know, in, in my own family, we have a 13-year-old who um, studied with me the piano and, and wasn't getting very far at all um, for years and years. Suddenly, at the age of eight, saw Amadeus and thought mo music could be fun watching the film and then ended up doing a grade every term from grade three to grade eight and um, won a term and, and really took to it with great enthusiasm. That was totally out of the blue and unexpected. So I think we've got to embrace these surprises and wait for them. We can actually prepare them as well in our lives by um, setting um, suitable circumstances in place that can lead us to unexpected, wonderful delights and always be prepared for them. Um, one of the most simple ways um, to prepare for zone experiences or eureka moments or creativity is to ensure that you get lots and lots and lots of sleep. Um, it's, it's, it's sleep deprivation is anathema to creativity. And if you speak to Alfred Brendel, um, uh, you will hear his routine for years was to practice in the morning, go to bed in the afternoon and sleep, wake up and re emerge refreshed. This is one of my favourite books, Conversations of Arrow, which I read you from by Joseph Horowitz, published in the early 1980s. And in that he describes how his routine is to make sure that he wakes up um, two hours before the start of a performance um, and that kind of gets rid of all the, the left brain order, if you like, refreshes the spirit, makes you feel young again and, and gives you a feeling of relaxation and renewed enthusiasm. 
Um, Adrian Bolt is very funny talking about um, sleep and says uh, in his book, before a concert, go to bed, no nonsense, take off all your clothes, get under the sheets, get a good nap. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, that it's very important to have, you can synchronize left brain, brain thinking and right brain thinking by writing a timetable for the day of a concert. And, and programming in when you're going to sleep. But the actual sleep process is, is the ultimate right brain stimulator because when you wake up, um, you feel a new, you, you've got rid of a whole lot of anxieties that may have been festering and, and you're ready to start and you should feel young when you come to the music. Um, it's very important, I think, to encourage and nurture curiosity and, and enthusiasm, those two things together, um, feeling that you are um, not experienced and wise and cynical, but young and inexperienced and open to new experiences and new thoughts and new ideas. The biggest enemy of um, creativity is feeling that you have the answers to everything. Um, in a sense, it doesn't matter if you know nothing provided you are able to open your mind and your spirit and soul via sleep, via um, negation of selfishness and the ego, and let other people fill your um, body, mind and soul with energy. Um, so that's, you know, perhaps a bit new age like, but I think it makes sense to me and it, it, it ties up with what Ara was saying. Um, it's very easy to get cynical and bogged down and stress in the life we lead. Um, in the second part of the summer school, I'm going to play a sonata by Ronald Center, who was an Aberdeen-born composer, born in 1913, died in 1973, um, who was, in the end, I think, died by suffering from depressed misery and bitterness over lack of recognition. Um, his story is worth mentioning at length. I think he's a wonderful composer. He never really left the northeast of Scotland, but his orchestra works early on were played by the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra, the Royal Scottish National Orchestra. And Solomon was playing the Bliss Concerto in the same programme that one of Ronald Centre's piece was played. And uh, Solomon was very interested in the sonata that I'm going to play because um, he liked the orchestral piece and he asked Ronald to send it to him and he said, I'll definitely play it. And of course he never did. And, you know, the centre wrote a very nasty letter to him and ruined his, you know, um, initial enthusiasm. Musicians are busy people and quite often they won't fulfil their, you know, good intended but um, not necessarily committal pledges to perform pieces and, and it happened all the time with Ronald. He, he upset the Edinburgh Quartet, he upset the BBC and in the end nobody played any of his pieces. Incidentally, how many of you listen to Radio 4, the Today programme? Yeah. Well, when you hear the Scottish voice Jim Nochte speaking, that's Ronald Centre's favourite pupil. So he sort of lives on in James Nochte. Um, and, and he ended up saying, and I met his widow, um, years later, and he said uh, Ronald's, Ronald's favourite quotation was, humanity's scum. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would have liked to have said in reply to that, um, that Oscar Wilde wrote, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. <laughs> I think that's the answer to give that. Of course we're all scum, and of course people are incredibly selfish and thoughtless. And particularly for those of us that have to teach teenagers or even um, college students the piano, I mean, it's not necessarily that they're scum, it's just that their um, sense of empathy and their emotional intelligence uh, is not necessarily cultivated to the highest level or is not necessarily a priority as yet. So, you know, I mean, I've gone through phases of, of, of sort of squirming inwardly, recently just confronting them and telling them they're incredibly rude. But, you know, I think the answer is actually to set an example and not let anything like that bother you whatsoever and connect away from egotistical concerns and let the wonderful energy of music flow into you so much that, that they're swept along with it and before they realise it, they've got amazing empathy and connection. <clears throat> That's certainly going to be the moral from September. Um, 
but it, it's interesting. So I'd, I'd also like to go on at this point um, to something quite controversial, and that is fidelity to the text and the ur text fetish of the last century. Uh, Liszt and um, Godowski and Hans von Bülow and Buzzoni and Rosenthal and many others would have used the original text um, of composers as the starting point and they would consider it or would have considered it uh, very wrong to just faithfully reproduce the markings on the text and not go any further. Aral used to go to Buzzoni's concerts and he said that he raped the music. Ara was a great Buzonian, but he said, they used that phrase, raped the music in performance. And it was, it was a starting point. Liszt, I said yesterday in the other talk, um, considered composition, improvisation, and technical d skills to be the three things that pianists should develop. And so in a sense, um, you know, every performance was connected to the art of composition. Uh, and every performance would be a kind of commentary on the music itself. Buzzoni assumed that the audience were so erudite and educated that they already knew the piece that he was going to play, so he would try a commentary on it instead. We all know that the finale of the Hammerklavier Sonata is incredibly loud, and yet Klemperer reported that Buzzoni played it pianissimo once as an experiment to see what it would be like. We are actually told that the one composer Buzzoni did not rape was Beethoven and that he, he considered the music like scripture. But Liszt as well, and von Bülow, if you look at his editions, there are some amazing fingerings that I use, and, but one would never nowadays do what von Bülow advocates to the music, because we came into a period of historical um, priorities, and Brendel says in his collection of essays, Musical Thoughts and Afterthoughts, that he considers um, himself to be a curator of a museum. And the idea of the Ortext edition came along um, after the Second World War, along with international competitions and along with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the nuclear age. They all came together. Um, and specialism came along as well at this period. And, and, and a sense of wanting authenticity, of which Arau is very um, much um, a, a pro-advocate, incidentally, the idea of having um, integrity and looking at the text. Richter being another, an, an immense figure who plays with extraordinary superhuman fidelity, at least by the additions that he had in Russia at the time. Um, that's all very well, um, and it's very important to immerse oneself in every marking that one has. Um, but how far does one go with markings? How far do the markings on the text actually take us? There's some amazing research being done recently showing that diminuendo hairpin signs can mean in certain pieces of Chopin and other romantic composers to slow down rather than to get softer. And different signs mean different things for different periods, and of course that's part of the musicological necessity for us to find out what all symbols mean, and we have to do that. But we have to look beyond the printed page and realize that the written symbols down there are already a transcription or an ad adaptation of a thought that the composer would have had. And where does the composer get his thoughts from? And um, rather conceitedly, Stravinsky talks about himself being the vessel through which the rite of spring flew, uh, uh, um, came. It's like he was the channel through which the rite of spring was written. Uh, and, and this is when we get into the collective unconsciousness again. Beyond the composer, there is a creative force that a kind of a chain that, that will go through the composer to the performer, to the audience, and we're all part of it. The audience is as mar much a part of the chain as the composer. Um, and so it's not enough to just feel that you're reproducing from an Urtext edition um, what's there. It goes beyond that. Um, some Urtext editions, incidentally, annoy me immensely. Um, a certain very famous German house calls themselves Artext, and, and, and yet on the other hand they have full 
um, to the brim fingerings by editors all over the place. It, it particularly upset me recently when we had the studies of Debussy, and Debussy writes at the front, um, Sergei les doigts, to look for the fingerings, and he says that he deliberately doesn't want to have any fingerings written on his music because he wants the performer to search hard and be creative and find his own solutions. Yet all the way through this so-called art text edition, um, we have fingerings added in. That's not right. That's not our text. That's a, a critical commentary. And another um, famous recent edition of the works of Chopin, produced as a national edition, has also infuriated me um, privately because the fingerings are placed so emphatically in the text it's almost as though one dare not do any other fingering or lest the, the wrath of Chopin will be upon you. Um, and, and yet there is often so many different possibilities with fingering and with pedaling in Chopin. Um, I, I'm a great fan of the Peters Chopin edition, which is taking place much more slowly and much more carefully, but is always full of inspiration and humility as well, because they seem to have found a way to put fingering in that says, OK, this is one possibility, but we're not going to get upset if you don't do it. And it's all about presentation, and there's great scholarship. I mean, I was delighted to go to Krakow in March and meet a, a colleague of Jan Ekie, and I mentioned all this and said that you know, the, these additions really make me feel very unhappy and upset. And he said, oh, nonsense. He said, I mean, I played the rondos to Jan, and I said, do I have to do what you say in your book? And he said, oh, no, I thought that that day. It's all right, you do something else that's perfectly fine. And he was very blasé about his edition and very happy for people to do different things than what are printed in the printed edition. And I think that's very encouraging. I mean, I think it's also important to remember that composers are only human, and what they might have written down one day, they wouldn't necessarily insist on 150 years later. Anybody who's worked with composers on recordings will have experienced what I've experienced many times, which is you prepare a piece and then suddenly the composer will jump up and change the music um, and say, oh, could you just take that bar out and do this instead in this take? And that's pretty stress, stressful, but it's also quite exciting because nine times out of ten, they are not so upset about changing their notes or having second thoughts. And of course, it depends on the composer. In the case of Chopin, uh, with the, um, a, we have at least three versions of it. Um, Benjamin Frith has recorded um, an ornamented version of the first Chopin Nocturne. We've got two versions of the Chopin Fantasy Impromptu. So there's all sorts of possibilities beyond what's written down on the written text. Um, so that's a huge subject. Um, and I think quite a complicated one. I would just say that in order to be more than a virtuoso, in order to be more um, uh, than, than um, a pianist who is loyal to the text, you've first got to be a virtuoso. You've first got to go through the trials of being able, able to show discipline and do what's written down on the text and then branch um, onward or upward or get even deeper into the music. Um, beyond all that. The collective unconsciousness can help us all in our everyday life, uh, I think, by taking us away from our fear of what other people think of us. I think it can give us tremendous strength. As musicians, uh, we have to be very tough on the outside and very sensitive on the inside. Um, and we're only human, we will only all, we're, we've all got inner demons that are threatening to pull us down, inner insecurities, we all get tired, we all get overwhelmed by pressure, we all find it hard to say no because we're so eager to please all the time. Um, we have an organic need for praise and approval and for fame if you like, uh, but perhaps that is um, ultimately not what we're about. I think ultimately we are going to um, give our souls to the collective 
Um, however you like to feel that, whether you like to feel as a Christian that you're going to go and join other souls in heaven or whether you'll be reincarnated as a Buddhist or whether you don't believe in any of that, whether you go into the earth soil and nurture the planet via, via that way, Whatever happens, our ultimate uh, destination is going to be a collective destination. We're not going to be on our own isolated. And I think that um, we are at our happiest when we let go of ourselves. Um, so concentration can make us overcome our terror and our fear of playing in public, our insecurities and our worries of being teachers and our fear of, um, of the work ahead of us and the enormity of the task of learning to play the piano. Even as an adult amateur, it is a huge task. Uh, but to give up is to die. I think you, it's all too easy to say, I'm stopping. And when people often do that, it's because they are so scared at the enormity of the task. Um, they have to learn to let go and to lose themselves if they truly love music and get into the zone by forgetting about getting into the zone, if I can put it that way. In order to, to get there, one has to not try. An awful lot in this book by Arau about Zen and the art of arch archery and the idea of, of not making any effort. And I would also add a lot about Alexander technique and end gaining. Um, when you do Alexander technique, you'll hear that phrase used a lot. Um, and not to try to do anything, but just to exist in the moment and enjoy each moment as, as an eternal uh, feeling and not worry about what's happening next. That is a great help, I think, to the, the whole um, ethos of, of getting out of oneself. Um, physical relaxation, physical well-being will certainly help the soul and the spirit. And the, the reverse happens as well. Um, okay, I mean, the, uh, disease, the very word itself, John Lill pointed out that, that, once, um, that disease is actually dis-ease, not being at ease with oneself. When one feels agitated and stressed, that's when all the injuries and problems happened. Uh, Dr. Wynne Parry, a decade or so ago, was a great authority on musicians' injuries and met many young pianists who were injured immediately before each Leeds piano competition, curiously enough. And he was absolutely convinced that it was the stress and the worry of, about, of entering this thing that would lead to over practice with, with tension which would lead to pains and, and injuries. Um, Yonti Solomon used to say um, to me in this course that he didn't think there was such a thing as tendonitis, as physical injury. I'm sure people will be very angry to hear that. And he said, I just hypnotize pupils uh, and that makes them better. I have tried um, lying pupils down on the floor in Palatine House on three occasions and getting them to relax and doing some simple transcendental meditation with them um, with amazing results. I don't think they had tendonitis, I think they were slightly inflamed and tight. Um, but simply to lie down on the floor, uh, close your eyes, probably in the Alexander position with boots on the floor, and count down slowly from 15 to 7 and gradually feel that you're getting lighter and lighter and breathe very calmly and then when you get to number seven feel that you're halfway between being stressed and being totally asleep then to um, open up a kind of cinema screen in your mind and visualize yourself physically healthy and and vibrant and feeling light and really good and keep that image for as long as you can then count back up to 15 and then gradually stand up that can be a very empowering thing to do um, I also think it's very good at the start of piano lessons for students and teachers to just have 30 seconds of deep breathing exercises and, and relaxing. I can't say I do this every time, but when I do it with students, it's always much better just to have a few moments of silence, a kind of Quaker meeting silence, where you just sit and relax, and that can, can open everything up so much more. In piano playing, um, getting towards the zone is so often 
about feeling that you have got bags and bags of time, that, that you're not under pressure. Um, so it goes without saying that an enormous amount of what you do when you practice to enable the zone to come in performance should be done at great slow tempo, uh, taken very, very slowly. It goes without saying that you should feel immense comfort and physical well-being when you are practicing. It goes without saying that you should be practicing in an environment which is inspiring and comforting. If you want to light candles, if you want to have uh, aromas in the practice room that you like, if you're a lavender lady or if you're a, <laughs> if you're a candle kid, then do that, you know, have, have that set up. If you, if you find it inspiring to have um, a portrait of Nelson Mandela above the piano or whatever, uh, then, then, uh, or Jessica Ennis or whatever, then have these icons up there as inspiration. That's all part of the development. But seriously, I think um, having a sense of, of ease and time when you play is the most important thing. And um, you know, Tobias Matty famously said, in his teaching, never play faster than you can think. And if you feel that there's always an extra layer that you could, if you wanted to, get faster than, then you are going to have a great ease and physical well-being. Um, I think that's about all I've, I've got to say, um, except I want to talk a little bit tongue-in-cheek, like about collect the, the collective unconsciousness on the Cheatham's Piano Summer School. Um, and it's always very amusing it, when people ring up to apply to the summer school and say that they must have X as a teacher and only X, and if they don't have X as a teacher, they're not going to come in the summer school. Um, it has to be that teacher and only that, and that's all they want, and if they don't go that, they'll be totally miserable. Uh, well, I would say that's against the ethos of the whole school. Um, in a sense, um, by embracing every teacher and every opportunity, you are gaining all of the collective knowledge of the whole faculty and the whole experience and having it there available for you to um, assimilate over the next 11 months before the next summer school comes along. You do not have to be doing something in order to learn more about piano playing. I would argue that you will probably learn much, much more if you go around as an observer and watch other people having lessons and take notes and look at the body language as well and look at the things that aren't said by the teacher. The very best teachers do not necessarily say anything at all or they might say things that hundreds of other teachers are able to say but the best teachers are usually the people that are able to relate to the student themselves. It's synergy, it's a sense of uh, coming together and moving upward to something very special and um, working uh, not to impress, not to say something smart that will make the people think wow or to impress people that are watching the lesson, but simply to get inside the musical world that is being created in the room and to bring it into something very special. That, that, that's really, really what it's all about. I don't think there's any particular great um, secrets in piano teaching other than experience and patience. But if there is, it's empathy and it's being able to connect with other people. Um, one should never feel angry in a piano lesson. One should never feel frustrated um, and usually feelings are beamed back. If a teacher feels before a piano lesson, oh my goodness me, I don't want to do this, then the pupil will be feeling the same. Um, when it's working well, time stands still and lessons pass in a blink. And it's the same with your practicing, and it's the same with Solomon playing Opus 111. Although in further reflection, it would probably feel that it is still continuing as performance at eternity as well as the shortest possible time. So I think I've just about said all I want to say. I've, can we have some hecklers and some questions? Yes? Hmm. I think you should always return to the score. I think it depends on the composer. If you look at the scores of Franz Liszt, 
there's not nearly so much information as in the scores of Bella Bartok. Uh, Bartok was trying to make a point. Um, but what, I, what I'm trying to get at is actually, it's how you interpret the markings. Um, if you look at a staccato mark, what does that mean? Does that mean a, a very short, or does it mean, or does it mean, you know, you could argue the case, or when you see an accent, does that mean a, or does it mean um, a delay? This is when the creativity and the freedom and the negating of the ego of the composer comes along. It's the interpretation. Um, um, we don't want musical machines. Um, another aspect of that would be pianists that are, metro are, are metronomically retentive, that kind of play like a metronome. Now, tempo is very interesting. There are, there are many instances when you really literally have to count incredibly disciplinedly. But if you were to put on the metronome with any great performance um, from a Brendel or a, a Barenboim, etc., within a bar or two, the metronome would get out with, the, with Barenboim or with Brendel. Is that because they can't play in time? Well, no, it isn't, and yes, it is. But time is something much different, and there has to be a kind of inner pulse uh, and, a, and a kind of interpretation even of pulse. Paderewski is often criticised for accelerandos and rushing in inverted commas in his playing. Now, what could be more natural when you're excited than rushing? You know, if you get excited, do you, do you speak slower? You know, it's inhuman almost. So it's how you, um, how you uh, distill all these qualities, these human qualities. It's how you interpret what's there already. Um, and it's not enough to be just like a kind of curator of a museum. That might be the starting point, but it's how you cur curate, how you, how you uh, respect the, the, the markings. Um, there's nothing worse than a pianist who has no discipline whatsoever and just does anything he likes and says, oh, I'm being an artist. And that's just absolute rubbish. Uh, you know, anybody knows that that in order to, to be a, a musician of the highest level, you have to go through a lot of sweat and tears in order to arrive at a discipline. But it's not enough to just be a vacuum cleaner and hoover up in a, um, a missing rests and add in Swartz Andes. We're, we're, we're more than char ladies in Beethoven. We've got to, to create something. It's, it's almost like bringing Frankenstein to life, isn't it? You know, we're, or bringing the monster in Mary, Mary Shelley's novel to life. We, we've got to kind of create something vibrant with, with flesh and blood as well as academic accuracy and go beyond all that. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah? I, 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 I've been asking for a haircut last week. Yes, please, so yes. Sorry, could you speak a bit louder? Bannister. Bannister, yes? Yeah, broke four minutes. Four minutes? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well done, yes. It's interesting to And it carries on, and we're yeah, getting it at all kinds of levels. I mean, one of the great sadnesses I have is that um, so many people love film music, yes. and and in the grand popular masses, and, and so much of it is is you know basically holds the planets or yeah. Alexander Nevsky, Prokofiev, or Shostakovich symphonies or 
or whatever, and, and yet people that love that music would never dream of going to a classical concert because they, they think they wouldn't like it. And there's some sort of missing connection. And yet all that music is in their unconscious, or in their, not so deep in their unconscious, it's that they, they, they know it in a certain context and they're not able to guess it. It's, it's how to connect with the masses. And not, not for any reason other than I feel that, that vast numbers of people in the world today are missing out on enormous pleasure and inspiration that, that, that we get a little bit of at least. Um, anybody else? Yeah? It's, uh, so you mentioned uh, lighting candles uh, while you're uh, playing things. Um, given the sensitive, alleged sensitivity of smoke alarms, can I ask you that's <laughs> again? <laughs> not in cheap, absolutely not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very dangerous era we live in. You've got to watch what you say. Uh, absolutely. But certainly synesthesia and, and connecting the senses, uh, it, it can be very, very beneficial. And, and thinking of music in terms of smells and associations. Um, I'll never forget playing with Sir Alexander Gibson, the conductor, and um, in, a, in, a, in a school in the Faroe Islands, of all places, Rachmaninoff, Paganini variations in the 1980s, and he suddenly said, oh, I feel terrified. And I said, what's the matter? He said, the smell of that soap, it's the same as the soap that they had in the Royal Scottish Academy of Music when I was a first study pianist and had to go and play shop on second skirt, so in my first year exam. <laughs> and, and its smell can be very powerful, um, indeed. And, and as can and visual, and the environment you're in, it, it's all part and parcel of of, of the, the inspiration that, that we need um, to, 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 to really get into the music that we love. Um, good, well thank you all very much and uh, we'll carry on talking uh, tonight perhaps in the bar but we've got lots of concerts to look forward to so thank you very much.